One of the big concerns in 2024 is the impact that generative artificial intelligence will have on the future of employment, the nature of work, and what consequences this could have for a country like India. Joining us now at the India Today Business Today studios at the World Economic Forum at Davos is one of the world's most renowned economists, the first Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Dr. Geeta Gopina. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your time and welcome back. Hi, Rahul. Great so to the join you. IMF has come out with a report which looks at the impact generative artificial intelligence has on workplaces, the nature of employment and uh, the future of work. Do you want to talk us through uh, what this means for India's young working age population and how this could change working in the way that we know it? Yeah. So Rahul, let me uh, start with the global impact that we expect in terms of jobs from uh, generative AI. Our estimate is that about 40% of jobs globally are vulnerable to 40%. 40%. Now, vulnerable doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing because some of those jobs you're exposed to AI, but in a positive way, which means it, it increases your productivity. But then you could have the other kind of exposure where it actually, you know, you get displaced. So if we do that breakdown, then it's about half and half. Now, there's a lot of variation. So if you look at the U.S., we have about a 60 percent exposure. About 30 percent of that was complementing the worker and 30 percent is not complementing the worker. If you look at India, because there's a very large number of workers who are in the agricultural sector, the exposure is lower at around 30 percent. So in a sense, India doesn't have the negative effect, widespread effect on the labor market, the potential negative effect on the labor market, but it also is then missing out on the positive effect of AI. So that's kind of the broad scope that we have. But usually when it came to, say, robotics or automation, the impact was on workers who were not very high up the skill pyramid. Now we're seeing a lot of what was previously considered very high end uh, work I was at a session on Gen AI in the morning at the Web Center, and a lot of, say, coding now can simply be done through generative artificial intelligence. You've got a young son. How do, how do people who are about to hit the working age population really deal with these changes and prepare to have a meaningful career and a meaningful life going forward? It's certainly the case that this is now replacing you know, cognitive uh, skills, which is a more ritual kind of more uh, you know, automatic kind of cognitive work. It is affecting the top end of the spectrum too. Actually, it may be benefiting the less experienced workers because the less experienced workers are able to use Gen AI to kind of build up experience very quickly because of the technology being able to aggregate whatever learning there is that you get from experience. So it benefits you if you have less experience. You're, if you're kind of middling uh, in the management scale, then it has some, somewhat, somewhat of a negative effect on you. At the very end, of course, the very, very best are going to benefit from this, uh, this technology. It complements them the most. But right below that, you might start seeing a negative effect. Now, what we also notice is that those at the very end in terms of skill, labor income skill and high incomes also tend to get capital income. And here's where the source of inequality can be the biggest, because we might see a lot more concentration of wealth, at least we're already seeing it in terms of where all the AI is getting developed and produced. It's in a few in a number of companies and in a couple of countries. It's basically the U.S. and in China. That's where most of the development is happening. So what are you telling your son in terms of preparing for a workforce in the future, of jobs in the future, where a lot of work can be done through generative AI and the rest through robotics and automation? You know, the first thing, young people have the advantage of being much faster in picking up new technology. Sure. Right. And so what I'm telling him is that he's obviously in college right now. So he's in a good place to learn the AI tools that can raise his productivity. I think the problem, of course, is for the older people who are usually not that savvy about picking up new technology. And there's where the risks would happen. So one of the consequences you asked about the impact on India is, I would say, specifically on call centers. Right. That is the one industry that could very quickly be, you know, driven out of business because of AI. And you would not see the kind of outsourcing of work that goes from the US to India through the call center. There is where you might see very quick effects. And, that, and that's one of the areas that one has to pay attention and to. As far as countries are concerned, which countries are likely to be the beneficiaries of this, uh, which are likely to be the biggest losers? Or do you think it's difficult to classify as far as countries are concerned? It's more down to individuals and companies. Right. So we know that countries that have a 
high level of human capital, great innovation space, good digital infrastructure, and the right kinds of regulation are going to benefit from it. So who are these countries? We actually did a, what we call a country preparedness index for AI. Among the top, you have the US, you have Singapore, you have Denmark, you have Germany. India is about the average for emerging markets, kind of in the middle of the pack. But the countries that are going to benefit from it are the ones who are at the up top end in terms of all of these uh, indicators.